for tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday evening, May the 25th, 1991. Memorial Weekend Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Walter Fletcher is the speaker of the evening. We have been uh, being taught concerning the sons of God or, or, or the Eagle Company or the Overcomers or whatever you want to call it. But uh, for a minute or two, I want to look at something here of five minutes. Might as well tell you right. In Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, uh, verse 27, it says that he, God and Jesus, that might present to himself a glorious church, what? Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. And Peter says, over in 1 Peter, chapter 1, and verse 15, it says, But as we which are called, which have called, but he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Why? Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now you say that's an impossibility. Well, evidently, God is expecting there to be a glorious church, and that glorious church is going to be without spot and wrinkle. And I'm of the opinion that those who are part of that glorious church without spot and wrinkle will have to come through some type of deliverance. I see no other way except through deliverance of some way, and those who enter into that place will be part of those who come through the deliverance. Now, Romans chapter 8 <clears throat> Everybody knows what Romans 8 is, I hope. Amen. But Romans chapter 8 and verse 19 says, For I reckon, I read 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in who? In us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waneth for what? The manifestation of the sons of God. There will be such a people. Who are they? Who are these people? What does Ephesians chapter 22 say? Or, excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 22. Let's go over here to Ezekiel. Ephesians would have been all right too, but uh, it's Ezekiel I want. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. God says to Ezekiel, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap for me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Is that true of you and me today? God is still looking for somebody to stand in that gap. Are you standing in that gap? Are you making up the hedge for the Lord Jesus? Hmm? Well, if there's going to be a church without spot and wrinkle, then evidently there are somebody who's making up that hedge. And... If there are, then who, again I say, who are these people? Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 9. And let's look at Ezekiel chapter 9. And he says, the Lord says through Ezekiel and, and unto Ezekiel here, says, And he cried in my ear with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the church to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men, number of man, came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand. But one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's ink horn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar, a place of judgment. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the chair wherein he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink horn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the church, through the midst of Jerusalem, the church, but set a mark as you go upon the foreheads of the men, the women, the boys, and the girls that sigh and cry for what? 
all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Who was he to put a mark on? Those who sighed and cried against the abominations. Man, woman, boy, and girl. <clears throat> I've always been taught by my tradition, my Pentecostal tradition, that uh, uh, I should fear the mark of the beast, and I should be afraid of the great tribulation. No, no, I no longer have any fear of the mark of the beast. I no longer have any fear of the tribulation. My fear is that I'm not, that I'm not marked by the man with the rider's ink horn by his side. That's my fear. Because if I'm marked with that mark, the, the, the mark of the beast and the tribulation has no effect on, on me or on you. <clears throat> and then to the others he said in my hearing, Go after ye after him through the city of Smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have you pity. Slay early old, old and young, both maids and little children, women, but come not near any man, woman, boy or girl, upon whom is my mark. Begin at my sanctuary. And God's already begun a sanctuary. It's already going on. And they began with the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth, and they slew in the church. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon the church? And then he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood. I'll make a comment. He didn't say the Jews. He said Judah and Israel. And you'll notice they're two different groups. They're not the same. <clears throat> and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. But I will recompense their way upon their head. <clears throat> and behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, he reported the matter, saying, I have done as you have commanded me. So that is happening, will happen, and I want to be one of those who is marked with a mark in my forehead that by the writer with the inkhorn by his side, clothed in linen. I want that, that. And then we find that to these who some call the Elijah Company or the Eagle Company, the, uh, the sons of God, but John the Revelator calls, calls them another uh, uh, something else. John the Revelator calls them the overcomer. Yes. And to the overcomer, to these who are marked with God's mark, the Eagle Company, the Sons of God, the overcomer, the Elijah Company, there is a, is a promise. There are eight promises in the book of Revelation to, to the man, woman, boy, or girl who desires to be an overcomer, who, who, who will be an intercessor and cry between the porch and the altar for the abominations that's in the household of faith. And the abominations are, are, are here in the household of faith. Uh, you stay around here very long and, and have all the, 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 uh, uh, the calls that come here and all the situations that we're confronted with and, thus con and, and, and that you, some of you, are confronted with. You'll know that the abominations are in the household of faith. But God says that he sent his son to set the captives free. And in his name, there is victory for, and, and, uh, to become an overcomer. Amen. He said, In my name, cast out devils, set the captives free, and heal the sick, and raise the dead. And there's a lot of people who are bound and dead, yet they're living. And they need to be, and are being, set free by the authority and the power of the name of the Lord Jesus. In Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 7, we have the first promise to the intercessor, the overcomer, whoever, whatever name you want to put on them. But, uh, uh, but, uh, 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 Peter's uh, 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 Romans, in Romans, they're called the, the sons of God. And we'll see what this says here in Revelation. Chapter 7 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat the tree of life. So out of the seven churches will come the overcomer, who God says he will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So you'll have eternal life. You're guaranteed uh, eternal life. <clears throat> Uh, promise number two to the overcomer is in verse 11. Him that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Life eternal. 
The second death has no hold on you. Number three, verse 17. To him that overcometh will I give to eat the hidden manna, which will, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Now, there's a new name written down in heaven. Amen. And God says he'll give us that new name. Number four is verse 26. To him that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. God says in his word that he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he says that we're his battle axe. And here he says that we're the ones that's going to do it. That, we're, that he's going to give us the power to rule over the nations. So it's going to fall the overcomer's responsibility to rule the nations. Uh, you're just because you're a Christian is not going to entitle you to rule and reign. It entitles you to eternal life. It entitles you to, to the kingdom. But it does not entitle you to a place of rulership in the kingdom. The only way you'll get your rulership, salvation, and the Holy Spirit, and healing is free. The rest of it you'll get because you labor and seek and desire to come to that place of maturity in the Lord. And then you will have a, a, a right to rule and reign. Otherwise, you have no right to rule and reign in the kingdom. However, you will be in the kingdom. So if you want to rule and reign in the kingdom, you better get busy and start working for the, for the kingdom. Become an intercessor. Pray and intercede for your local area, for, for your the church, for your pastor, for your family. Be an intercessor and let the devil know that you're there. Chapter 3, verse 5 and number 5. To him that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Evidently, your name can be blotted out. That does away with eternal security right there. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So he will confess us before the Father and before the heavenly angels. Number six is, chapter, is verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God in the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. What is that new Jerusalem? It's the, it, it's the bride, the body of Christ. And what are you going to be in it? Be a pillar. What does a pillar do? It holds up the building. So you're going to be a pillar to hold up the building, the, the house of the Lord. Amen. Uh, number seven is verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sit down with my Father in his throne. Now, that sounds like that's the ultimate, doesn't it? To sit in the throne with the Lord Jesus. That means the place of rulership. But there's one more. Chapter 21. There are eight promises, not seven. And in chapter 21, we have the final eighth promise. Verse 7. To him that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Talk about sonship. That's sonship. In its force. Amen. So if you want to be uh, uh, a son of God, if you want to be uh, uh, rule and reign with Jesus, become an intercessor. Stand in the gap and make up the hedge for the Lord Jesus. Amen. Brother Fletcher, you and Sister Fletcher have from now until 6 o'clock in the morning at prayer meeting time. Amen. Come. Aren't you excited about what God is doing? Amen. I am so excited about what the Lord Jesus is doing in this hour. And I'm so glad to be a part of it. So many times we look back and we think, oh, I wish I'd have lived in this particular era or time. But I'm glad I lived today. And I'm glad I'm right in the middle of what God is doing. And all he asks for that is that we have a heart to do what he says. I appreciate all of the scriptures that Brother Glenn shared because it's to him who hath an ear to hear. Let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord sang. God's after our ear today that we might hear what he's saying, that we might begin to do what he wants us to do. I just really feel challenged to share with you to focus in on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let other things gain your attention. Many, many times there are so many things that are happening in the world today and that are happening in our lives that are very valid. And yet God is after our undivided attention, that our focus would be on him, that we would not see situations 
We would not see people. We wouldn't see anything as bigger than God. Can you say amen to that? So many times situations present themselves and we look at it and we say, Lord, how will you ever? But I love Sister Irma's testimony tonight because by the faithfulness of the prayers of the parents, they have seen their daughter come back to the fold. And that is exciting. No situation is too big for God. And we thank the Lord also for his individuality to our lives. Don't you love the Lord for that? I am so glad that God knows me, that he knows my name, and that every individual situation that I have, he is an individual God for. That means that no matter how small it is or no matter how big it is, I can bring it to the Lord. And I have so appreciated the emphasis on repentance because if we don't go to the place of repentance in God, God can never begin to do with us what he wants to do. Ad appeared in the paper one time under the lost and found column that said, lost dog has one ear, sees out of one eye, three legs, no tail, answers to the name of Lucky. <laughs> How many of you appreciate that? So when you think you got it bad, remember lucky. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This has been a rich, rich time today, hasn't it? Amen. I feel like Peter. Lord, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for me. We would just like to stay here, amen? amen. I mean, you know, that's not what it's about, though. Amen. Hallelujah. Go with me in your Bibles quickly to the book of Genesis and the third chapter. Genesis and the third chapter. Very familiar passage of scripture. I'm going to begin at verse 6. And read a few verses here. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. And if you have it, say Amen. Amen. It's like good sheep ready to graze. Right? Genesis 3 and verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband, come on, with her. How many of you felt like for a long time that Adam was on somewhere on the other side of the garden, you know, plowing the back 40? The Bible says he was with her, and he ate. Don't you feel good about that? <laughs> then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the woman, the man and his wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Just a little passing comment. you notice that. If you have a good margin, study Bible. But the word cool of the day there is translated wind or breeze. Here we have the so-called record of the fall, the first man and woman, God's hidden agenda. I mean, you know, Jesus told Nicodemus, who wanted to know something about the kingdom, the wind blows where it will. And you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell from whence it comes or where it's going. So is everyone who is born from above, born again. How many of you believe that this is an hour where we've had more people born from beneath than born from above? We've had more stillbirths in the kingdom than live births in the kingdom. How many of you believe we've changed the upper room for the supper room, too? <laughs> Amen. But I believe that the God is coming once again with the wind and the breeze of his spirit to meet with the people. Amen. We find in the book of Acts in chapter 2, and they all were together, come on, in an upper room and in one accord, one purpose on their mind, seeking God, a sound as, as a mighty rushing wind, and God did something again. I'm here to announce to you tonight that God is ready to blow again upon his people amen. in a way that we've not experienced in a generation. Can you say amen? amen? Verse 9, And the Lord God called the man and said to him, Where are you? 
And he said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden. And watch this, the first time we have it mentioned. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. First time we have fear introduced here in the Bible. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. I want to talk to you briefly, recognizing that the mind can only take in what the seat can endure. <laughs> I, I want to talk to you about exposing the great cover-up, or if you like, what do you do after you've dressed for success? I mean, you know, there's a book out about dress for success. What do you do after you've dressed for success? You've got to have a little something more going for you than just the right apparel. Amen? Or, if you please, how to get rid of the fig leaves in your life. <laughs> how do you think that'll work? Isn't that what we've been here for? Getting rid of the fig leaves in our life. And I want you to understand, if we're going to understand the great cover-up, and we all have heard this, uh, if we've been in the uh, things of God any time, we've heard this particular passage of Scripture. We've heard the account of the fall of man. But I want to expose a great cover-up because I want you to see that when the man and the woman had partaken of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God told them that they were not to take up, God came into the garden not as a judge first and foremost, but he came as a father. Hello? If he had come into the garden there in that particular time as a judge, now we know he does judge the sin, but hear me, he comes as a father. If he had come as a judge into the garden at that time, he would have said, Adam and Eve, you have partaken of the tree of which I forbid you to eat. You have been found guilty. Now these here are your punishment. But he doesn't do that. I want you to see that he comes in the garden as a father, as he does to each and every one of us. When we've blown it, come on. Amen. When we have partaken of that for which he said, you shall not. He comes and he approaches us as a father. He comes to the man and the woman as he had always done. He'd come to keep his appointment with them. He'd come to fellowship and commune with them as he had always done, even though he knew what they had done. And we know he approaches them as a father because he asked these redemptive questions. I want to share them with you tonight. They're very, very powerful. The first question we have is in verse 9. God comes into the garden. He says to the man, come on, where are you? How many of you know that God was not trying to locate the man? How many of you know God wanted the man to locate himself? God knew already where he was and what had happened. But the question that he asked was that of a father to probe, if you please, redemptively, so that the man would be honest before God. Amen. Now, if you can get a hold of this night, it will deliver you from the fig leaf syndrome that goes on in the body of Christ again and again and again. Where are you? If you can ask yourself that as an individual, that I'm either here I'm here in God, but I need to be there in God. You can get rid of the fig leaves tonight. Tonight, before you leave. Amen? Amen. Where am I in God? The truth of the matter is, each and every one of us are as close to God tonight as we want to be. Mm. If we'll come honestly before God. I say they were redemptive questions. Where am I in God? Why did John the Beloved lay his head upon the breast of Jesus? Because he wanted to. Hello? Amen. I said because he wanted to. Amen. How many of you believe there was a place for you and I tonight? In the bosom of our Lord. If we dare lean upon the bosom of our Lord. Get his heartbeat. Get his perspective. Amen? Where are you in God tonight? Second question, and please notice that the man was not willing to be honest. 
He, he, he still is dealing with this cover-up. He said, I heard of thee, verse 10, the sound of thee in the garden. I was afraid, fear entered in. Because I was naked, so I hid myself. God comes in as a father. The man is experiencing this fear. We heard this morning that fear has no place in our life. God has not given us a spirit of fear. God had come as a father because perfect love wanted to cast out all fear. Get rid of the cover-up. I, I was afraid, and I hid myself. Are you there, saints? Amen. Second question, verse 11. Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were naked? Powerful question. If we can answer that question. Who told me this sense of nakedness I'm feeling? This sense of inadequacy? This sense where I need to cover up myself from what I am before God? Who told you you were naked? And the implication of, of God's question is, Adam, you have got this information outside of me. Because up until that time, the man communed with God. Every bit of information, naming of the animals and all of that, came from a fellowship and a relationship that was unguarded, unclosed before God. Amen. Who told you you were naked? And I want to ask you tonight, have you been walking around with some fig leaves in your life? Have you covered up what you are before God? Has it been some circumstance that has come to paralyze you? Maybe like Adam with fear and you've hidden what you are before God. How many of you know the issue of which God came to them was not their nakedness? How many of you know they didn't have on any clothes before that time? Hello? How many of you know the issue was how they felt about what happened? And many of you have felt a certain way about things that have happened. Maybe through a, a family situation, you have uh, had, as it were, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're never going to be anything, you're no good, uh, you know, or somebody's told you you were born on the wrong side of the track, or come on, there's a host of things that have come to tell us that we were inadequate, we were naked, and we weren't what God said we were. Amen? And if we can discover... Who told us we were naked? Where does the sense of inadequacy come from? That I don't feel, though I see what God wants, I don't feel that I am, I am capable of reaching out in God once again. Who told me I was naked? And then the third question comes right on the heels of that. And I say God is still probing here with the redemptive question. Have you eaten of the tree of which I forbid you to eat? Hmm? Where did you get your information from? What have you been feeding on that has caused this sense of distorted view of your relationship to me? Are you there, saints? Amen. Because here's the truth of the matter. Some of the most damaging judgments we make, we make about ourselves. Hmm? Yeah. Have you eaten of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, which I forbid you to eat? And here's the thing you need to understand. Sometimes the facts belie the truth about you. Sometimes the facts belie the truth about you. Let me help you with this. You remember in John chapter 11 when uh, Lazarus had died? Jesus had received a message, word from uh, Mary and Martha that he whom you love is sick. And the Bible says that Jesus stayed two days longer. He didn't come to Lazarus, and by the time he got there, come on, you know, Lazarus was dead and had been in the grave four long days. And Martha comes up to Jesus, and she begins to rehearse to him all of the facts. Lord, we sent for you, and you didn't come. Our brother was sick, and we knew if you got here, he'd get well. He's been in the grave now four days, and he stinks. She rehearsed to him all of the facts, but how many of you know she was facing the truth? Amen. Hello? Amen. And Jesus, without saying anything about the facts, he says unto her the truth, said I not unto you. If you can believe, you'll see the glory of God. Amen. Your brother's going to live. And often, beloved, we face the facts in our lives. We face situations just like Martha and Mary. We say, Lord, here are a sick family situation. And Jesus, if you can get here, I know this family situation will get well. 
Or, Lord, here I have got some sick finances on my hand. And I know if Jesus, if you can just get here in time, this sickness is going to get well. Are you out there? Lord, I know that I've got this relationship, and it's a sick relationship, and I want it to get well. And I know if Jesus can get here in time, it'll get well. But it seems as if he waits two days longer. Why? Because this has come for the glory of God. And you cannot have a resurrection until you've had a death. God wants to bring some glory and God wants to bring some resurrection life and power to you and I tonight. But we've got to first ask ourselves, who told us we were naked? And where did I get this information from? And even if I'm facing the facts, I can still go to him who is the truth. He'll never lie to us. As a matter of fact, I love the description of him in the book of the Revelation. He's called the faithful and the true. That's the kind of Lord I serve. How about you? I want you to understand something. God wanted the man and the woman to be honest with where they were at. God wanted them to take responsibility for what had taken place. Now, he had already anticipated, we know, anticipated the fall. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So God was not troubled by the man and the woman's condition. He knew what he was going to do. As a matter of fact, in anticipation of the cross, he, he killed an innocent animal and covered them. Come on. Amen. Indicating sacrifice, blood spilling. Come on. And covered them with the skins of an innocent animal. What God wanted of them, beloved, he wanted honesty. He wanted transparency. He wanted to restore them to the relationship that they had had. But let me tell you what happens. When we are not honest with God, with where we're at in God, then a phenomena happens which I, I will call the projector phenomena. The projector phenomena. If any of you have ever been uh, watched any film or anything, you go in, the lights are dim, the uh, camera gets to rolling, and uh, you, you're caught up in the light and the, and the action and the music and everything, and you forget that somebody in the back of the room is running a film strip. And you forget that what you are watching on the screen as beautiful 3D and everything is only an illusion. It never left the film strip. Hello? And what Adam did and Eve did, they projected their irresponsibility onto others. Uh And it never left the film strip. For Adam says in verse 12, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. See, Adam blamed, Adam blamed God. In blaming the woman, he insinuated, God, this is your fault. If you hadn't given me this woman, I wouldn't be in this condition. How many you recognize that Adam didn't say, take her back? <laughs> Who else is he going to blame the next time? Are you there? When you project your irresponsibility, when you project where you are in God onto others, it never leaves you. You've got to deal with it, and that's what God wanted. So Adam blames the woman, and the woman turns and blames the serpent. The serpent turns and says, "Uh uh-oh. Huh? What do you do with the fig leaves in your life? How do I get rid of the fig leaves in, the, in, in, in my life? Well, go with me to, uh, uh, I'm just going to just very briefly give you some things here that will help you uh, uh, identify, uh, hopefully, not just identify, but how to deal with those fig leaves. Go with me to John 1, please. I'm going to be brief here tonight. John 1, verse 45. How many of you see something tonight? Amen. John chapter 1, let me begin at verse 45. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, What? Come and see. see. Uh, Jesus saw Nathanael coming and said to him, Now please watch this. Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus said to Philip, Come on, watch this. Before Philip Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. 
But how many of you know it was the come out that brought the revelation? He was under the fig tree, and Nathaniel says to Philip, We have. And even though he was doubting, uh, uh, Nathaniel, uh, uh, Philip said, uh, Come and see. He was under the fig tree. I just want you to see a picture here, a type. He was sitting under the shadow, under the shade of that fig tree. Jesus said, I saw you there. But he didn't stay there. He wasn't counting on the shade of that tree to bring a greater revelation Amen. in his life. He said, I'll come and see. And Jesus said, here's one who has no cover-up, no guile. Here's one who is pure in heart. If I may use that term, you'll understand what I'm saying. Nothing alloyed about him. Here's one who is sincere. And though he had his doubts, he did something about his doubts. When Philip said, come and see, he got up and started going toward Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, here's one in whom there is no guile. He said, how do you know me? He said, when, I, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you there. But watch this. This is marvelous. And Nathanael said unto him, verse 49, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. What's going to happen? Going to have open heavens. What was obscuring Adam's view there in the garden? Something had happened. Something had closed up between him and God. He didn't see what he saw before. He lost God consciousness and became self-conscious. Sin conscious. But Jesus said, Truly I say unto you, you shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending. I'm going to give you a new sight. You're going to see differently. You're going to see the things of the kingdom. You're going to see the kingdom of God. And you're going to see transaction that's going to be as in heaven, so on earth. Come on, are you out there? I want you to know that's what God wants to do in each and every one of your life. When you come out from under the fig tree. And you begin to come and say, I'm going to come and see. I'm not going to stay under the shade of this. Come on. I'm going to get out where the light of the full, the, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ can be seen once again. What Adam and Eve were missing there in the garden was that glory that shined in the face of Jesus Christ. When he said, I'm going to come and see. That was an act of faith, you see. Uh, Jesus said, you're going to see. The heavens open and the angels ascending and descending. You're going to understand the things of God and the purposes of God. Hallelujah. Go with me quickly to Mark 11. Mark 11. Are you still with me? Amen. Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 12. On the next day when they departed from Bethany, speaking of Jesus and his disciples, he, speaking of Jesus, became hungry. And seeing at a distance... A fig tree in leaf. He went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it's not the season for figs. And he answered and said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Verse 20. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree with it from the roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi... Behold, the fig tree which you have cursed is withered. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Have faith in God. Very interesting story here. Jesus walking through fig tree orchard, whatever. He's hungry. He's looking for fruit. It's not the time for this fig tree to bear fruit. And he curses the fig tree. How I many think that it would be rather strange to watch somebody going through some orchard talking to trees. Huh? Uh, Jesus did all kind of strange things, I mean, as far as the disciples were, were concerned. And no doubt when Jesus did this, and the scripture makes a particular point that it wasn't even time for this fig tree to have fruit on it. And yet in spite of that, Jesus spoke to this fig tree, cursed the fig tree. Why would he do that? And nothing evidently happened at that moment. Can't you see the disciples, as they probably were always wont to do, scratching their head and whispering to one another, what's going on now? But I want 
you to see something. Verse uh, 14 gives the key. His disciples were listening. His disciples were listening. In other words, class is in session. I, it is time now to reveal how to get rid of the fig leaves in your life. Hello? Class is in session. Jesus is a master teacher. And they come the next day. Jesus didn't even tell them anything about it until Peter observed something was different. They passed this way and now they come the next morning and they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Please notice. From the and Peter said, Rabbi, the fig tree which you curse has withered. And Jesus says, have faith in God. I believe that Jesus, as he stood there at that fig tree, though he was hungry, and he looked at that fig tree that bore no fruit, I don't believe he was any longer, as it were, standing there with the disciples. I think he was standing in the garden, there in the book of Genesis. And I think he was looking at a fig tree that became a great cover-up, that became a good instrument of hiding and obscuring the light and the glory of God, that which became, that which hindered the fellowship of God, I believe as he stood there and looked at this fig tree, this tree that had lots of relief. Please turn the tape over for side two. Thank you. It became that which hindered the fellowship of God. And I believe as he stood there and looked at this fig tree, this tree that had lots of leaves but bore no fruit for the kingdom of God, he said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. And when Peter makes this announcement, Jesus says, this is how you get rid of fig thieves. Have faith. He didn't say have faith in your faith. I mean, no, we got a whole theology about how to have faith in your faith today. Jesus didn't say have faith in your faith. He didn't say have faith in your feelings. Come on. Are you out there? He said, have faith in God. Redirect your faith from maybe the facts of your circumstance, from the fig trees that bear no fruit in your life in the kingdom of God. Redirect your attention from that and from yourself and from your sin directed to God. Have faith in God. Now watch this. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, now wait a minute, Jesus. You just got through talking about a tree. And now you're talking about a mountain. What is Jesus saying? Whether the problem in your life that has obscured the relationship to God seems like a tree or whether it seems like a mountain of opposition, you can speak to it in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And it's going to have to give way. So he says, speak to the mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says is going to happen. It shall be granted to him. Now, we've been saying some things here, haven't we, at this camp meeting? We've been saying some things about our circumstances. We've been seeing God speak some things about them. We've been saying, beloved, what we've been seeing in our lives here is that the tree, the fig trees in our life, which have obscured the relationship to God, are being re removed. And God is getting to the root cause, and it's withering from the root up, not just from the top down. Often we'll crop off the thing so nobody will know we're growing fig trees. Amen. Amen. God said, I want to get, I want to, I want to lay the axe to the root cause. And Jesus said, if you'll say and believe what he says is going to happen, it will grant it to him. The law of faith is I must first own it in the spirit if I want to see it manifest in the flesh. And by saying something, the disciples didn't see that tree change the first day they, that Jesus said something to the tree. There was no visible results. But how many of you know that when Jesus said something out of his mouth, the power of life, come on, the words with power went out of his mouth and already in something was taking place. I want you to understand when you begin to speak to your situation and your fig leaf and... and, and mountain situation, even though it doesn't appear that anything has changed, I want you to know that Almighty God has taken note of it, and already in the heavenly realm, things are beginning to uh, be manifest. Amen. Glory. Now watch this. That isn't all he says. Watch this. 
Verse 24, therefore, therefore, I say all things for which you pray, ask, believe that you receive them, they will be granted. Verse 25, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. How many of you know that Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent and Adam went so far as to insinuate God? Now, he says here that there's got to be a coming together of right relationships. There can't be this projecting any longer of why I am like I am, this nakedness, this sense of inadequacy, though it may have been perpetrated through someone else or some other thing or some, some circumstance that you had no control of. There has to come a time when you forgive and when you no longer project it because to forgive means to give up. Yes. Forgive means to give to. To forgive means to give for. And don't you know that Jesus Christ did every one of those things for us? He gave up his life for us. He gave his life to us. He gave his life for us. Hallelujah. And beloved, that's what it means to forgive, to release and to let go. And there's always that danger that, uh, you know, in I think it's Belize, they catch monkeys this way. They will cut a hole into a coconut and drop a peanut over in the coconut. So the monkey sees the, the peanut over in the coconut and reaches its little arm over in the coconut and lays a hold of the peanut and tries to take its hand out of the coconut and the hole isn't big enough to get his hand and the peanut out of the coconut and he becomes a very good meal. Now some of us are holding on to peanut ideas, circumstances that will bring no fruit in your life for the kingdom of God. And you've held on to them for years, and the only way you're going to find a deliverance is to let them go. Hallelujah. Whenever you pray standing, forgive. If, you, if it, there's anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you of your transgressions. And if you do not forgive, come on, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you of your transgressions. And so we've got to have not only to speak to those things which bear no fruit in our life, the fig trees, the life, but we've also got to forgive. We've got to release those. We've got to say, Father, I no longer hold it to their account because Jesus, you held it, uh, you, you put it on Jesus. Amen. How many understand this? We've got to understand this. God doesn't play double jeopardy in our life. If he laid it on Jesus, come on, he's not going to lay it on you too. Amen. If we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us, not just cover it up, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if any man sin, not that he has to, but if he sin, he's got a defense attorney, Amen. not a prosecuting attorney, a defense attorney with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin. Hallelujah. Are you excited about this? Amen. Just two more scriptures, please. I want you to see Paul picks up on this concept, I believe, in 2 Corinthians 3. Dr. Knowles, I believe, brought it out this morning. Let me refer to it. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 4 and following. And such confidence we have through Christ toward God. What did Adam and Eve lose? Confidence to come before God. Paul says we've got confidence through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate. They felt the sense of inadequacy. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. Come on. But our adequacy is from God. Say that with me. Our adequacy is from God. Now, Paul goes on here to refer to the Old Covenant and how the law could bring nothing but death. Not because the law was not a righteous standard, not because the law did not uh, display the holiness and the purity of God, but because they could not fulfill God's requirement. And he talks about how this law came into being. He said it was a ministry of death because it had to do with regulations and ritual. May I say religious stuff? Are you there? How I many you know a lot of people are dying doing the religious stuff? And here he says this ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses 
because of the glory of his face fading as it was. You know, for a long time I used to think when Moses went up on that mountain those 40 days and, and came back down the mountain and, and he came down, the glory of the Lord was shining upon his face. I used to think that Moses covered his face with that veil so that they would not see the glory. But the Scripture does not say that. The Scripture says, and Paul interprets what happened there, he said that Moses covered his face so that they wouldn't realize that the glory that was upon him was fading away. He couldn't keep it. How many of you know the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ? Verse 12, having therefore such hope, we use great boldness in our speech, not as Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, that the sons of Israel might not look intently at what was fading away, but their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil, may I say fig leaves, remains unlifted. Why? Because it's only removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their hearts. And whenever a man, come on, turns to the Lord, the veil, the fig leaves are taken away. Here's the context. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, come on, there's liberty, there's freedom, there's deliverance. For we all, say that with me, we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a the glory of the Lord. What did Adam and Eve lose in the garden? The sense of the Shekinah. The sense of the glory of God. They couldn't approach God. They hid for fear of God. But he tells us that in Jesus Christ, that the veil has been removed. The fig leaves can be taken off. The tree can, the axe can be laid to the tree because the veil is removed in Christ. And for you and I who recognize the Lordship of the Spirit of the Lord, there's going to be freedom, deliverance. As we behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, something dynamically is happening in our life. We are going, come on, we're being transformed into that same image. From glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. What Adam and Eve lost, you and I are coming into that glory. Did you see it this morning or this night? Amen. The glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. By the Spirit of the Lord. But it's behold, though it seems like in a mirror. <laughs> huh? How many of you know that, that, that the mirror reflect is a reflection? Amen? And as you're beholding Him, beholding His glory, beholding His adequacy, beholding His sufficiency, beholding His accomplished work, then you're going to begin to experience, by the power of the Spirit of the living God, a transforming glory in your life. I said the other night, Christ in you is the hope of glory, but God's intention is to get you in Christ the glory. Yes, amen. Somebody believes it. Amen. Yes, amen. Let me close with this. Isaiah 60. How many believe you can get rid of the fig leaves? Amen. How many believe you can keep them off? Yes. Amen. See, Paul said, He has been made unto us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And he could have gone on because Christ is our all in all. And Paul says, we don't, our confidence isn't in the flesh any longer, but our boast is in God. Hmm? Isaiah 60. Why don't you stand with me? You know it, but let's look at it in the context of this tonight. Isaiah got a revelation here. Come on, he's speaking to the people of God. Arise, shine, get rid of those fig leaves, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. How many of you know that's happening now? But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Why? Let's, let's get practical. Why is God doing it? Hmm? Why does the enemy want to keep you covered up in fig leaves? Why does he want you to continue to dig your way around your mountain? Amen. Come on. God wants to reveal some glory. God did not say when the man and the woman fell in the garden, plan B. God had a plan. That the boundaries of the garden of Eden... 
would extend to the ends of the earth. For God said, Moses, to even Moses, though these people won't be the people, I'm going to have a people, and as surely as I live, all the earth Hallelujah. is going to be filled with a knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Say, come on, arise. Now, verse 3. For the nations will come to your lights, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about you and see they're all gathering together to come to you. Your sons will come from afar, and your daughters will, will be carried in your arms. How many of you got some, some far-off uh, children tonight? <laughs> Amen? Uh, you need to claim this, the Word of God here. Even Peter said, this promise is unto you and to your children, and as are many as are far off. Amen. Even if you've got prodigals that have hit the door, and they're in a far country, I want you to believe God tonight that they're coming in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill because of the abundance of the sea will be turned to you, and the wealth of the nations will come to you. So, beloved, tonight... You can get rid of the fig leaves forever. God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And Christ in you being that hope of glory. And He working in you to perform a good work. How many of you know He's going to perform it? He's going to accomplish it even until the day of Jesus Christ. God doesn't do it. He doesn't start a thing and go, mm, I'm a little tired, let me do something else. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 10, we are His workmanship. Yes. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You know what that word workmanship means? It means masterpiece. Masterpiece. How you think about this, if you've ever gone to an art gallery, you'll walk through a number of rooms and you'll say, yes, yes, that's so-and-so's painting or whatever. And you might have four or five uh, paintings of that particular artist displayed. Then you'll go into another room, and there'll be a light shining, and, and uh, only one picture in the room. And you go over to that particular painting, and you look at it, and you say, well, why? That's the, the, the same artist that was in the other room. There were four other paintings. But, ah, this particular painting is different because this is his masterpiece. Yes. And they set it off and display it in a room all by itself. And I want you to see, though, God has done some marvelous things in our history. God has done some marvelous things in past revivals. Honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. Hallelujah. For the glory of the Lord is being revealed upon a people. And God's going to show them off to the world. Our brother read about it in Romans 8. The sons of God. And the whole earth waits and groans till the manifestation. No more cover-up. But we'll display the full light of the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus Glory Christ, we come tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you are the one who exposes the great covenant. And Jesus, we thank you that you are the way and the truth. And not only the truth, you are the life. Yes. Lord, we come tonight. Because we want to walk in more, Lord. We want, to, yes. we want to display that beauty and that glory, Lord God, in our lives. We don't want anything that covers us up and obscures, Lord God, what we are before you. Oh, God, we ask tonight in the name of Jesus yes. that you will help us to speak to every mi mountain, every lying spirit, everything that's come to obscure, Lord God, the light, everything that doesn't bear fruit to the kingdom of God in our life. We speak to those things in the name of Jesus. We say be lifted up from here and be cast into the sea. You have no place in my life. No, oh, Lord, we ask for that transforming glory. You said turn your eyes upon Jesus. Yes. Look full in His wonderful face. Yes. And the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Hallelujah. Father, we thank You that no matter how far we have fallen, Jesus Christ has come to redeem us from our falling shorts, as someone said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank You that where sin has a grace doth more abound tonight. Lord, we ask that You'll minister Your grace and Your life to us, Lord God. That we might truly, Lord God, go from here, Lord God. The priests came in one way, but they were to go out another way. Lord, we've come to be changed. We've come yes. not only to be challenged. Yes. We've come to be changed and to be conformed to the image of thy dear Son. 
Lord, we ask that you'll work that work in our hearts by the Spirit of the Lord and where the Spirit is, Lord. We declare you Lord tonight. Have your way, Lord God, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Sister Fletcher made the remark when she was speaking that Irma had talked about our daughter. There's room on the tape here, so I will add what she said to the in, end of the tape. Irma, Irma said that uh, she uh, would say something about our daughter, and I think that's the place to do it. Oh, I wasn't really prepared uh, for I that tonight. <laughs> I, think, I think right now it would be... I didn't bring my Kleenex. What, you? <laughs> uh, you? <laughs> I, I never have cared too much for crying women. <laughs> <laughs> I used to supervise about 70 women, and you know, when you have a big job to get out, you don't need a crying woman. <laughs> so I, I, I uh, we came here in 1974. Uh, my mother and father had come a little bit ahead of us to help run the place because we were coming out of California, and uh, we were four generation Pentecostal family, and uh, our daughter. And her husband was here with three children, my mother and dad and Glenn and I. Well, we came in March, and everything was lovely. My dad was an Assembly of God minister for 50 years or more. And uh, the first deliverance service we had in the fall, uh, they, uh, they were, it was a very calm deliverance service, <laughs> nothing like we had here today. It was up in, in our mo new mobile home. We hadn't even moved into it. We were, and uh, uh, they, they became very upset because they wanted us to build an Assembly of God church out here. And uh, so they told us either we had to stop. Our calling was to have families pull back together. So many families are separated in these days. And so many people needed help. So many children needed help, young people. And that's what the Lord called us to do. And we never dreamed that the enemy would come in family. Now, we had already given up all of our hard-earned money that we had earned for many years, working very good jobs, and uh, bought this place. So they told us, either you stop this kind of praying for people, and getting people healed and delivered, or we were going to move. And I didn't think, I didn't believe, I couldn't understand it. I just said, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with you people. I'm your only daughter, and I have a brother, and I always went with them in evangelistic meetings, and, and uh, I just couldn't believe it. And uh, I said, we, you know, I said to my dad, you know, you have to stay in the calling for which God has called you. I said, we wouldn't have given up on our jobs in California to come here to build a church. Anyway, they have five Assembly of God churches in this town. And uh, he didn't say too much about my mother. She just said, well, we're going to move. You, you make up your mind right now. And they called Glenn in and told him. And he didn't say anything because they were my parents. But I said, well, we're not going to stop. See, the devil was making one last hitch. And in, in that very day, they just walked out and bought a house 60 miles away and moved. And they told our daughter, you better get out of here and bring your family. So they moved. And so we were just left here, you know, with naked faith. And the Lord has brought all of this to pass. <laughs> all of our friends, all of our, all the people, we have hundreds of children and young people and marriages and people have been have come back together that were divorced and, and separated and God has just marvelously delivered people here and, and uh, 17 years our daughter has not been to see us and she wouldn't talk to us most of the time and a year ago she wrote me a letter her three children have all come back they're very troubled young people and uh, they, they all have been here, but she was going to send another little, her other little boy that we've only seen once. And uh, so she wrote me a letter a year ago, 
You know, the enemy has terrible ways to get at you through your family. And she said, I'm now a Catholic. I'm going to send Billy, but you cannot pray over him. You cannot talk about casting out any demons over him. He doesn't have to listen to you reading the Bible, and he doesn't have to come to church, even though he's going to be staying with you. All I did was just throw it in the wastebasket basket and laugh at the devil. Uh-huh. I thought, <laughs> this is your last big stand. Yeah, yeah. And then over Christmas this year, then we didn't hear from her heart at all. If I sent her any gifts, she'd throw it down, throw it away. And here she is, a young girl that has sung with Phil Kerr in, in his uh, singing group in California since she was 15 years old. Very talented, played the accordion. The children were all talented and, and musically. And uh, so over Christmas, I never ever miss a camp meeting, but I, I just couldn't come because I had such a, a deep cold in my chest, was coughing. So we had a big ice storm, and I just didn't come over here. And I read the new book by Derek Prince, Curses Are Blessing, You Can Choose. And we have ca- broken over all kinds of people here, all kinds of curses. We have prayed for her, and there days and days we'd pray, and there'd be days that we just didn't pray. I just I finally stood on a scripture. Lord, we brought her up in the right way, and when she's old, she won't depart from it. And I thought, Lord, do I have to go to my grave without her coming back? When are you going to, to touch her? When are you going to move her? Well, I, I went line by line of what Brother Prince had said to do to break alienation of families. How many have children that, or grandchildren or, or husbands or wives or people that are away from the Lord? Yes. So I went down little by little by little. And every day I would break those powers off of her. And two weeks later, we were having the intercessors prayer group on Thursday. That's our prayer day and, and the fasting day. And there, somebody called for Glenn. They come and got Glenn. And they, people call him all the time. Salesman calls. I didn't think anything about it. We just went on some meeting. But it was our daughter. And she asked the girl in shipping. She says, I want to talk to my daddy. And she said, well, who is your daddy? And she said, well, Glenn Miller. And... Uh, So she come and got Glenn, but I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. And and it was her, and she was wanting some tapes. She was making tapes for a big charismatic church in Louisville. And and she had come back to the Lord, and she was rejoicing, and we sent her tapes. And then she was asking for tapes. She remembered years ago, we used to go to CFO camps and full gospel conventions. We did their tapes. And she was wanting, uh, you know, Bob Mumford's tapes and and Don Basham's and Derek Prince's. So we've been sending them to her. And I didn't know you were going to do this tonight because uh, she just wrote me a letter. You just cannot believe what the Lord's done for that girl. <laughs> she just can't believe it. She she was praying a prayer for her own children, a prayer of deliverance for them. <laughs> And, and I wish I had it up on my desk, Glenn, in a big brown envelope that she said, it is just really, really something how the Lord Jesus can pull families back together. There is nothing too hard for Jesus. Absolutely nothing. Now, I'm not crying because I'm sad. I'm crying because I'm happy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Is Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. There is nothing that you have done, no sin that you have done, that Jesus will not forgive you. The blood of Jesus avails. The blood of Jesus avails. The blood of Jesus avails. Hallelujah. Repentance is not out of style, it's right in. It's right in vogue. And I tell you, we need more repentance. We need more repentance. And we need, uh, I'll tell you, for a while, I never gave the devil the privilege of looking at me cry and worry over her. I just sort of was in limbo, you know, just existing and believing. 
And I quote that scripture, bring up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. And I thought, here she is, 48 years old this fall. And I thought, well, Lord, she is pretty getting old. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all kinds of things go through your mind. It, it's, been a, it's been a tremendous trial, but the joy was, was the uh, people that have come here that have been delivered and changed. Now, she wrote a whole sermon in here. On, in front of the kids used to go with the camera. Yeah, they used to sing with the Camerons. Uh, she did. She played her accordion. And Donnie played a, a guitar and a banjo, and, and they all played tambourines, and they sung with the Camerons. He's written all about the Philistines and Dagon. And she says right in here that you can't put the false god up with the true god, because the false god won't win. <laughs> and, uh, and she's telling all about all this. I have to look for this. Here's her, here's her prayer. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of the devil, demon, Dagon, and the legion of demons that follow him over me and my family and my children. And I claim the blood of Jesus over us. Word of God, Satan, I have broke your power over me and my family and my children. In Jesus' name, I'm free. I have the victory. <laughs> Satan, hide from it, but be persistent. <laughs> Don't let the devil talk you out of it. He will try to make you think nothing is happening. He will deceive you every way he can. Think it will even get worse. <laughs> but be persistent. She has some spizzerinctum in her, <laughs> like her mother. <laughs> he has to obey you. And the only way you can wound him is with the Bible, the true word of God. <laughs> the same word or the sword that Jesus is going to use when he comes back to put Satan under his feet. She gives me scriptures, Revelations 19, <laughs> Revelations 21, 2 and 3. We have the authority, or Jesus gave us his okay to use his name and authority until he gets back. <laughs> It's like the master went on a trip and left us in charge while he's gone. We are to take care of his business. <laughs> and up like this, she knew all this before she went away. So you have the master's authority while he's gone. He left all the instructions written down in the Bible. The Bible is your umbrella, your shelter in a time of storm. It's our only armor. Put it on. Don't let Satan rob you. The end is in sight. Glenora. <laughs> and then she writes more. I won't take any more of um, Dr. Fletcher's time, but uh, but she. Uh, well, here's something else. Uh, leave. Let's see. She's talking about the occult and the false gods. If you want to hear God talking to your Bible. And start reading it. <laughs> you will begin to see and hear more than you can conceive. You will not only hear God, you will see him as Jesus did in all his glory. We have been coming against this religious, deceitful spirit. They tell each other that they are spiritual, and that's religious, lying spirits that likes to hear that they're spiritual. She's talking about religious spirits. <laughs> so, so... I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to expect when we see her. We've only seen her once in all these years. But you know, trials come. Jesus gives us power to overcome. Yeah. He gives us the sustaining grace to walk through almost anything. And it has been difficult for me in many ways. And we have prayed for all kinds of addicts, all kinds of uh, homosexuals, sexual sins, kinds of drugs that people have been on, and they've been mightily delivered. We were in California this year. One of the young men that came the first year we were here, the first year we were here, we had 17 fellows here. They were helping clear the land, and I was cooking for them besides running the office uptown. And 
they 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 were trying they were just off the of drugs i've never been around drugs and it was a trying time for me also they were trying to be freed and delivered and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed for them well one of the young men is now a prophet of the lord and i frankly believe that he was one of the ones that i would have never thought that the lord could have done anything like that see the lord jesus when he comes to change us and because he said i'm not going to change god said i change not it's you that has to change and all of us needs to keep changing and and seeking the lord and we've had wonderful meetings it's been such a pleasure to pray for all of you and the lord gives us strength he gives us his might, the spirit of might, the seven spirits of the Lord. And I'm telling you that Brent and I used to work very hard in the publications and as, as coordinators for the aerospace industry. We'd work just as hard for them as we're working now for Jesus. And it's a lot more pleasurable. And we love every one of you. And, and we want to see all of you free. We don't want anybody here to go away saying we didn't get what we come after because Jesus is here. The anointing is here to destroy the yokes off of you. And don't give up. Just keep and believing and asking. It doesn't hurt to ask twice or three times. You know, Jesus prayed for the blind man twice. So if you've been prayed for yesterday and you still feel something that needs to be changed in your life, come again we'll be glad to pray for you tomorrow and monday and we want you to go away rejoicing and singing and go back to your families and you know jesus told legion he wanted to go with jesus he said no you go back and tell your family what the lord has done for you and the more you testify about what the lord has done for you the stronger you're going to get we overcome by the word by the word of god the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. The word of God cleans our minds and sustains us. You know, I used to read the Psalms out loud to, to myself. And, and I, would, I would just believe that one day our whole family was going to be come back together. And I'll tell you the whole key to this. It may surprise you. The whole key to all of these problems. Uh, and we didn't know it was as serious. But now we know it's serious. Was the spirit of divination and the occult in my mother my grandmother my great grandmother and the curses that that has brought on our family has is serious it is serious in all of your families if you've been to fortune tellers if you've played with a ouija board if you've been in the cults of any kind you need to be delivered because you don't know what it's going to do to your children your grandchildren your great grandchildren those curses are visited down to the third and the fourth generation fortune teller but my mother had my grandmother had my great grandmother from germany had been so it was visited down upon me and uh, the curse of divorce uh, with our daughter and and all all other kinds of troubles suicides i don't have any suicides in my family line but but glenn does in his and uh, all those things can be taken care of we don't have to use this is lord Amen. praise the lord This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.